Good evening, everybody. I am Ruben Hernandez Leon, Professor of Sociology and Director of the UCLA Latin American Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our last uh, presentation, our last event of the series um, on migrant children navigating educational systems series, a, a um, series that we have organized at the Latin American Institute through our outreach program. Our outreach program is coordinated by my colleague, uh, Veronica Zavala, who is here and will be um, handling the Q&A part of the presentation. But for now, it is my um, distinct pleasure to welcome Silvia Rodriguez Vega, Professor Silvia Rodriguez Vega, who's assistant professor in the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and author of the book, Drawing Deportation, Art and Resistance Among Immigrant Children, published recently. And um, Silvia is actually an old friend uh, of uh, the LAI and of, UC of UCLA. She uh, received her degree, uh, her PhD uh, at this institution. And we're actually very happy that she's not gone that far from us, just a uh, you know, couple of hours or less uh, from here and part of the UC system. So Silvia, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation to present your work in this important series. Uh, many teachers benefit from and participate of the workshops and, and events organized through our outreach uh, program. And uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, the last of a year long series on uh, migrant children who are navigating different uh, societies, borders and educational systems as they move across and travel between two or more countries sometimes. So Silvia, thank you again and welcome. Thank you for being here. Hi everyone, it's an honor to be here, to be back. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen, but I'm actually, I'm wondering if it's working. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to be virtually here with all of you. Um, of course, I wanna thank Veronica Zavala and Professor Ruben Hernandez Leon for inviting me and for thinking about this work specifically to the Latin American Institute. Um, so I just wanna express by, ex start by expressing just how happy I am to be returning to UCLA not too long ago. Um, I completed my degree there and it's wonderful to be back sharing this work with all of you that really took shape while I was a doctoral student at UCLA. So, the book just came out in February of this year, and coincidentally, it happened to be Valentine's Day. I did not pick that day for publication, but I thought it was very romantic and beautiful. And um, in Orange County, there's a bookstore that wrote about the book, and the author talked about the book as being a love letter to immigrant children, and I thought that was exactly right. Um, and so in this love letter to immigrant children, um, I'm so happy to be sharing it with all of you and to start by sharing just a quick chapter outline. Um, so these are the various chapters that the book covers aside from the introduction and conclusion. And I really wish that I had some more time to be able to go through each of them. But I think what um, I will do is to highlight some of the stories from two of the chapters, specifically chapter two um, and the response from children in Arizona and uh, some children in California, but bringing a little bit of the resilience um, that this art process really um, exemplified. So in this book, I argue that Young immigrant children are not passive in the face of the challenges presented by US anti-immigrant policies. Through an analysis of pre-adolescence drawings, theater performances, and family interviews, we can gain key insights into both 
the impact of the deportation machinery on immigrant children's lives, and how they develop personal agency to creatively respond, manage their emotions, and reimagine the dilemmas presented by anti-immigrant rhetoric and legal violence. The origins of this book started when I was working as an undergraduate many years ago at a community center in Phoenix, Arizona. I was in charge of creating a summer arts camp and through many workshops like dance, poetry, um, choral reading, muralism, I took students on a journey of using art. And the final week we were creating a mural and I asked the kids, what do you all wanna see a mural about? And one of the kids said, can we do a mural about peace? And I said, that sounds like a beautiful idea. Can you tell me what peace looks like? And I'll never forget this kid said, peace looks like Sheriff Joe Arpaio shaking hands with a Mexican. And this really resonated with the class and the rest of the students because often I would have students come in and say, um, we can't find my mom or my dad has gone missing. And so this opportunity to visualize peace in this way was an important moment. However, the mural was too controversial at the end to go up on the wall of this community center. And students were really upset that the mural wasn't going to happen. So I asked them, can you do a drawing or write a poem or a letter about why this mural matters to you? And so this book, all those 15 years ago, really is the culmination of all of the, this work. And it started with these drawings. And so I'll start by sharing this one. This image was the drawing that first pulled me into this work. It spoke to me in a very profound way. It was like holding a mirror to my life and the life of many other immigrant people. Gabby was 14 years old when she drew this. Her and her family lived along Van Buren Street, which is one of the poorest and most ignored communities of Phoenix, Arizona. She and many of the youth I met lived in a community of mobile homes right across the street from the school and community center where I worked. She would come into the center with a backpack full of homework that we would work on together. Gabby would always volunteer to help me pass out peanut butter and grape jelly sandwiches. One day, Gabby ran into the center with no backpack, telling me that the sheriffs have taken her dad. Because of immigration, she cried. Soon her dad was deported and her mother struggled to make ends meet. Gabby stopped coming to the center and she was even afraid to go to school because she thought that her mom would also be taken during one of the raids. Here in this drawing, the sun, trees and flowers are all depressed and the people in the house are frowning. The family feels that metaphorically they are living in a cage, unable to have contact with the outside world. Gabby's drawing foreshadows the insidious immigration policies that would continuously become more restrictive, like the reform prisons called family daycare centers, where toddlers were detained with their parents. This image is symbolic of the ways that the US continues to disappear family members or take children away from their families as a means of surveillance, coercion, and control, going from caged childhoods to caged children in the span of just two political administrations. This work echoes Laura Briggs's work in her book, Taking Children, and historically repeats the separation, enslavement, and sale of Black children to white families, the detention of Japanese Americans in internment camps, and the kidnapping of Native American children to be quote unquote, Americanized in boarding schools. These tactics are used to bring hopelessness, despair and grief to a community and a lineage of people. But Gabby was not the only child I worked with at the community center in Phoenix who wanted to visualize the story of detention or deportation through drawings. Here are a couple more of those drawings. This image is drawn by Laura who's nine years old and it depicts a nighttime arrest of what she labels a Mexican mom and a Mexican dad. 
where Sheriff Dora Pio handcuffs the parents in front of the son and daughter on the bottom right hand corner. On the left, you see people at the bus stop who are sending hearts and saying things like OMG, bearing witness, but not being able to help. This image with the huge clouds and the big lightning and the huge moon uh, reminds us of what a nightmare might look like. It looks like a dark and stormy night as the word night is underlined. Similarly, Julio, who's 10 years old, drew this image where a sheriff with paper white skin is handcuffing a brown man and he's saying, as he says, don't take me, I have a family to take care of. And the one arresting replies back saying, I don't care with nine exclamation points. As you can see, the sheriff and his deputies were important figures in the drawings of the children. Also, Cynthia, who's seven years old um, and just at the age of seven can describe the important nuances of a nighttime arrest of an individual on their knees with a t-shirt that reads, I am Mexican. She also labels one of the officers as sheriffs, but draws a police vehicle. And so these drawings really bring to the forefront the dangers of, of just leaving your home or feeling like you're trapped in your home. The last one from Arizona that I'll share now is this one by Omar, who's 12 years old. And accompanying this drawing, he says, in Arizona, the sheriff, Joe Arpaio, arrests any person that looks Mexican, no matter if they are a US citizen or not. He sends them to jail, where they get beat up and treated like animals. That leaves kids alone in the USA, away from their parents to get adopted by a family member if lucky. And so Omar drew this powerful image that looks like a political cartoon with very patriotic red, white, and blue um, colors. He says, freedom is America. And then at the bottom, there's a response to that in a very sarcastic, tone uh, with just pencil saying, yeah, right. This image of the sheriff really foreshadows or, or talks about how immigrant children feel um, dehumanized. For example, you see the sign on the left hand says Mexicans are not humans, and he's stomping on a Mexican flag. Um, he also has the word Mexicans on his tie which is crossed out. And so Omar draws this very satirical image of Sheriff Jorapayo with this very large belly. Um, and so this image is a critique about these very patriotic narratives that children receive in schools about the United States um, and these narratives of the land of opportunity and, and the land of freedom, while at the same time, their families are being uh, in danger of separation or um, they feel dehumanized. And so this work in Arizona that you see here led me to create a dissertation project that eventually became this book. Um, Specifically in Arizona, the project was from 2008 until 2011. And during that time, Obama was president. And this work came from various community centers, mainly with Mexican origin children, ages five through 17. And I collected 200 drawings. So there's more of a visual arts focus. And then in Los Angeles, California from 2014 till 2018, um, what is really important about this time is that it was during the election and the second year was Trump's first year in office. So this data really gave me insight about children's perceptions pre and post Trump. And it was a school based project with um, Mexican children, but also many Central American children. Um, children were in sixth grade, so their ages ranged from 11 years old to 13. And I collected 135 drawings. However, in California, I did um, emphasize more the theater and performance component of the project. And to do the project, I partnered with the Los Angeles Unified School District and the public art, uh, the Social and Public Art Resource Center in Venice to create an art-based program, um, but specifically I created the curriculum for a sixth grade theater class 
that was bilingual Spanish and English. But I also um, interviewed children, their family members, and the teachers. I conducted school and home observations. And I recorded every class session, every performance we had. I also had pre and post surveys before the school year started and after. And um, although I have all of this data, most of it is an analysis of the drawings along with the narratives that came from the interviews and journal entries. And to give you a little bit more insight about the curriculum, because I know many educators are here, um, these were the three aspects that I used to create the sixth grade theater class. So specifically, I used El Teatro Campesino. Um, so El Teatro Campesino was started by Luis Valdez on the picket lines of the United Farm Workers Movement in 1965. And the company created and performed actos or short skits on the backs of trucks that would drive through farm working fields. And actos were meant to satirize the opposition and to express what people are feeling. I also used Theater of the Oppressed, which was started by Augusto Boal in Brazil. And Theater of the Oppressed is a set of various participatory techniques and games that seek to motivate people restore true dialogue and create a space for participants to discuss and take action. I specifically used a technique called image theater and newspaper theater. And what you see here is image theater, people using their bodies to create statues or frozen images. But newspaper theater involved creating skits about the things that we see on the radio or uh, that we hear on the radio or see on the news. I also used Paulo Freire's problem posing pedagogy, which serves to develop students' power to critically perceive the way that they exist in the world. Um, so here students are seen as active agents who are co-constructing knowledge with each other and with myself. This work has various interventions. First, to provide insight about this understudied population to provide creative tools to counter the effects of toxic stress on students, and to center art as the visual testimonies, positioning children as active agents. And four, to advance interdisciplinary, critical, culturally sustaining pedagogies. So I wanna to turn to the California portion of the work, and this comes from chapter five, and um, more specifically, here I find that children who are part of mixed status families are deeply preoccupied with detention and heightened anti-immigrant sentiments. However, through the art making process, educators can facilitate moments of reflection, coping and resilience. So although there are many stories I wanna share, um, I wanna share one from what I said is chapter five. Uh, through the perspective of two of my students, Eric and Elisa. During one of our check-in activities, students were sharing their journal, journal reflections and drawings of what they did during the weekend. That weekend happened to be Mother's Day. Students shared about going out to dinner and having celebrations for their moms. I noticed that Elisa was not as animated as she usually was. When it was her turn to share, she showed a cartoon of a, of a woman and under the image read a sentence in Spanish that said, I miss my mom so much. I have not seen her in two years. Elisa is 12, but made the journey alone from El Salvador to Los Angeles when she was only 10 years old. In LA, she reunited with her aunt and her cousin, Eric, who is also in the same theater class. Although Elisa is happy to be in LA with her extended family and to be attending school, she suffers very much because she's unable to be with her mom and depends on Facebook and video chats to keep in touch with her. Eric and Elisa walk to school together every day, but they don't really hang out together at school. Ms. Sol, the sixth grade teacher, calls Eric one of the good students because Eric is serious and he likes to focus on his schoolwork. One day when we were figuring out what the word immigrant means, Eric raised his hand and he said, I know my cousin Alex. 
He said, I was so happy that my cousin Alex was coming to the US, but he actually died in the desert. I guess of starvation or thirst, I don't know. We didn't know anything about my cousin until we saw on the news that his body was found on the border. And that day during this moment, Elisa made this drawing during that journaling activity. Framed by the sun and the moon, the cacti brings us to the setting of the desert and a small cross with the name Alex is below. However, the most important part of this image is the television set in the center that says the name of the news show, Primer Impacto, or translated as First Impact. And it literally was the first impact because this is how they found out that Alex's body had been found. This drawing is an altar, an homage to the life of Alex, a way of remembering. Here, Elisa commemorates the life of her cousin. And this isn't unlike the many murals, t-shirts, social media posts, songs, or street altars or ofrendas that youth in many inner city communities have to create to remember. When reading her journal entry that accompanied this drawing, she said, my cousin was a great person. My aunt loved him a lot. He did not want her to work so much. Weeks passed since he left. We knew he was walking through the desert, but we did not hear from him. The news was also broadcasted in El Salvador. We could not believe it. Months later, they sent his body back. My aunt buried his body without telling anyone. Until this day, it causes us a lot of pain to talk about this. Rest in peace, Alex. This moment of journaling provided time to reflect and the drawing allowed for processing and the sharing with each other allowed for coping. This gave Eric and Elisa the space, time and permission to talk about what was not to be mentioned at home. Here, they turned individual pain into a moment of collective support and healing. And for the rest of the class, this story was really impactful and also intense. It really resonated with other students who started to share their own stories about immigration, about death, about separation and pain in general. The story in particular was so memorable that months later when we were working on our final performance that we would perform in front of the whole school and families, um, one of the students remembered this. And in an exercise of creating our final performance, each student takes turns sharing one line of the play. But the first student who shared said, my name is Alex and I'm going to cross the border, taking us back to this very story. However, in this moment of imagination and creation, they decided to create a future that they did want. So here, rather than dying on the border, Alex, the main character, migrates with the help of two other children who are accompanying him through the desert and all of the dangers that one finds there. And with the help of a magical creature who is half human, half coyote, they're able to get through all of the other scary parts of the desert and encounter their parents who are also there to help them. But of course, Trump is at the border. And so this is a storyboard that the kids created from the final performance. And this was projected on top of the stage so that people could follow along with what was happening if they didn't speak English or didn't speak Spanish. And so this play is called Los Niños Inmigrantes, or The Immigrant Children. And as you see here, Eric and Elisa actually played key characters who helped er, um, the main character, Alex, migrate and, and make it to the United States. So I wanna share a quick four minute clip that is about one of our practices for this final performance. And since it's a practice, you're gonna see funny things like kids laughing. Um, you're gonna hear a term we say, which is no talking butts. And that means that you need to always face your audience when you're speaking. You're also gonna hear stage directions and some volume requests. And so here in the first part, you'll meet the main characters and you'll hear their goal. Hi, 
And so, of course, to cross many borders, the easiest way is to jump on a plane. So they're going to go to the airport, but you see that the TSA agents find their documents suspicious. So they have no other choice than to go through the desert. Okay. Hi, I'm Daniel. Daniel. Everybody backstage. Oh, yeah, I'm Daniel. Because I'm setting so good. Yeah. And the parents are there to help them cross. Hello, Mr. Security Guard. Hello, what are you doing here? Where's the restroom? Over there. I want to take you from here to go by yourself. Take me to the restroom, please. Go. Go. Okay, I'm going to go to the restroom. Oh, there's Chuck. But of course, Trump is there to check on the border wall, but finds a security guard missing. So here is, so here, so here is the no, border. Where's the, where's the security guard? Where's the security I put right here? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? This is your job. I don't know. <laughs> Why? No. Please give me another chance. No, get out of here. Bye. Why is it so dusty? Oh, shoot. Oh, my wig. <laughs> so this wig falling is the reason that the family's able to get back together. And you'll see the wig fall again when they practice a bell. So I include here in this clip. Uh, when they're practicing a bow, because you see that, again, when the Trump character bows and the wig falls off, it makes the kids around them laugh. And when this happened during our performance, it was the moment that the audience started laughing uncontrollably. So people were laughing and clapping. And it was a really important moment because it was when everyone lost fear to them. 
This was the reason that the family was able to come back together. This bright blonde yellowish wig that the student wears juxtaposed by his brown skin serves as a symbol of power. The moment that the wig falls through humor, they're able to take back that power. The satire that makes fun of Trump's hair is how they mirror the dehumanization that they experience. And I agree with Broiles Gonzalez, who says that only the magic of laughter could radically and credibly suspend the seriousness of an entire social system of oppression. Including Jose Esteban Munoz, who asserts that comedy does not exist independently of rage, which really came through with this performance. Overall, my findings are that students demonstrate this rage, this righteous indignation to dehumanization and racism while reimagining through art as a form of resisting violence and developing resilience. The story of Alex through the narrative of Eric and Elisa illustrates how anti-immigrant laws ultimately impact children and create stress and trauma that impacts their academic performance mental health, and well-being. Yet through art, educators can help children challenge these power structures and develop tools for coping. Already, immigrant children must navigate multiple borders at home, at school, code switching through various social contexts, and even different countries. This third space sometimes marginal space leads to an imaginative potential. Scholars like W.B. Du Bois, Gloria Saldua, Leo Chavez, Pat Savella, Lynn Stevens have called this in-betweenness, nepantla, double consciousness, liminal space or interstitiality, to describe how a person's life is shaped by two cultures and yet they feel that they don't belong neither here nor there. Children of immigrants often have citizenship but not membership in American society. And literature of immigrant children can deem them passive, enforcing narratives of victimization. But here I strive to position children as active agents of their own stories, where through theater, drawing, and humor, they're able to speak back and reimagine destructive situations in ways that many adults cannot. I want to end with this quote by Ms. Sol, who was the, the teacher of the sixth grade class where I taught theater. And she said, art, I see it as their medicine. These boys were notorious at the school from kinder until sixth grade to be terrors. I really think it was healing them. Theater was an escape from who they are. But this book asks us to question, what if children did not need an escape from their communities and from who they are? Drawing deportation provides a roadmap for how art can provide a safe and necessary space for vulnerable populations to assert their humanity in a world that would rather divest them of it. Thank you all very much. And I really look forward to hearing your questions and your thoughts um, and reactions. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Silvia Rodriguez, for sharing your, your work. And now we want to open up for questions, comments um, via uh, the Q&A or the chat room, either in Spanish or English. Uh, they're welcome. Wow, I'm, I'm still kind of digesting all these images. They're, just, they're so impactful. Um, and in the meantime, while we get some of these questions and comments, I want to ask you, like, what was your involvement in this um, theatrical, like, um, performance of the students? Were you, were you there? Were you managing them? What was your, like, um, role in, in, in these performances? Yeah, it does take a moment to sit with the images and the stories. It is a lot. So I, I agree that um, sometimes we just have to think about what we just saw. Um, but my involvement, I saw it mostly as a facilitator. So I would have different mm -hmm. lessons where we would um, talk about whatever they wanted to talk about, but I would facilitate different theater exercises and activities. And so 
Um, when it was time for our final performance, I helped them come up with the story of this final play. So each student said one line and then that each story basically became um, a whole theater skit. And um, when they performed it in front of the parents and the school and everyone, it was really powerful to see them take these stories and create something and, and talk about those things that many parents were talking about or that teachers don't like to discuss in a classroom. Um, but what I found was that they were very impacted by what was happening. And so my role, I just saw it as a facilitator of giving them some skills and some activities that led to these stories coming out and being dialogue and then embodying them, putting them, trying on these characters of what, what does it feel like to pretend that you're, that you're Trump or that you're a teacher or that you're a parent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a really challenging like labor and work and stuff in at the same time like it challenging but a really impactful and invaluable work. Um so I I can't even imagine all the challenges that you went through in doing this kind of work. Um and we are really, really appreciative of all this. So we have a comment here in by Jessica Rivas and she's asking about possibilities about collaborating with you. Um is it possible to partner with you in the HSPRS Community Engagement Associate at the Church World Service Orange County? We provide home study and post release services to accompany the children. We want to provide social emotional support for our children, for our kids through our. Yeah, I I invite you, Jessica, to email me. I definitely um, can partner with you and um, I wanna know more about what you're doing. So please email me. Um, but I do think that this is some, a tool, not necessarily specifically what I do, but art in general is a really powerful tool to work with children, um, not just immigrant children, of course, but I find that it is really powerful to work with kids who may have a hard time expressing themselves, especially verbally um, and I also want to add that the kids that I worked with were really concerned about many topics. They were talking about climate change and um, bullying and so many things. Um, so it was a tool to facilitate dialogue about all aspects of our society and things that they contend with on a daily basis. But of course, I gathered the stories about immigration and presented them all together. But it is a really beautiful tool to use when working with young people. So please email me. Well, thank you for, for sharing. Um, uh, Joan Beltran. And I'm not, I think you have access to the to view the questions, but I'll read in for you just um, you. for everyone else who don't have access uh, to this, they can hear the question. Um, Joan Beltran. Um, okay, now that we, that's how the way it is now. Your work is amazing. That's one piece of wisdom you offer to academics in training who want to turn their dissertation into a book. Thank you, and I'll be emailing you. So it's more of a compliment. Thank you, Thank you. and I love the damn Daniel because that. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that you know I'll add is that it is a really terrible, hard, heartbreaking topic when we're talking about children who are afraid of family separation or who have experienced it. And I think that the activities of using art and drawing and journaling provide moments of relief from all of that through like, you know, for them, the Damn Daniel video, for those who don't know, is a video that became viral on social media about somebody's shoes. And this character called Damn Daniel was like something that was going on a lot. And so the kids plugged it into the skit. And I just let them have the freedom to make things funny that maybe weren't funny or that they thought needed some humor. Uh, and it ended up being a very powerful medicine to these really hard conversations. Definitely. Well, thank you. Um, we have another common question from Reina Rodas. Do you have any upcoming projects, anything you were currently working on or what to tackle next? Loved hearing about this, really incredible. Thank you, Reina. Um, yeah, I mean, right now 
I'm really excited to be sharing the book with all of you and with as many people as possible because one of the things that I promised myself internally and to the kids that I was working with was that I wanted as many people to see these images and, and know these stories um, because I feel that their stories and their images and, and their narratives are worthy of being known. Um, and so right now, my biggest priority is to share this work with as many people as possible. But I'm also um, continuing to work in areas of art and immigration. I'm collaborating with an organization called Define American to understand the needs of undocumented artists. I'm also working with an organization in San Francisco, the Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project um, in the areas of film. And so I am really looking forward to continuing this work at the intersections of art, immigration, education, policy, uh, community engagement, social justice. Uh, but I, I would love to know more about what you all are thinking about and, and um, working on too. Yes, definitely. Um, from Paloma Villegas, thank you for sharing your amazing research. How do you navigate the constant process with children and families? But uh, you navigate with the constant processes with children and families, particularly because of videotaping families' precarious immigration status. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful, important and powerful question because the IRB process was quite extensive working on this project, specifically the California one, um, because they are a vulnerable population, not just immigrants, but from mixed status families. Some other family members are undocumented. Some of them are undocumented. They're um, minors. Um, there was a lot of building up to this project, not just in terms of having the forms that I needed or the permissions, but in thinking about ways that I would work with them that would not endanger their lives, specifically because of their immigration status. And so that involved not collecting signatures, not keeping any of their addresses or names or phone numbers. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is, what do the kids think about this years after, you know? But because of the IRB process, I wasn't able to keep in touch with them. And so, you know, these were some of the, the precautions that I had to take. And in addition to that, um, having my own training and working with the school psychologist, like school counselor, working with a drama therapist, and also training myself to have trauma-informed tools that, would, um, that wouldn't re-traumatize or open up things. And, and if that happened, having the tools and resources that children and families need to navigate some of the things that would come up that aren't um, so positive and, and um, that are, are hurtful and stressful. Well, it sounds like a, a lot of work on your end, for sure. Yeah, it was a lot of work, but it, it, was, it was necessary to be able to do the work in an ethical way, which I think is really important. Definitely. So moving on with some of the other comments, questions from Denise Lopez. Was it possible to incorporate pro bono immigration assistance for the parents to find out the, if there were any pos possibility to address their immigration status? Likewise, was there any possibility to provide counseling to deep emotions students and parenting uh, to go through? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I feel like schools are so drastically underfunded that the resources both um, from a legal standpoint and from a mental wellness standpoint aren't there in general, let alone art classes. So often the schools where you go, art isn't an existing class and something that is often done after school. And so often these schools don't have resources, but there are community organizations that do um, pro bono work. And I would direct parents to those organizations, specifically the ones in LA. Um, I also, if parents needed to translate things or to like, I made myself available in those ways, but I also um, had a list of resources to connect them to. And, but it is sad that those resources aren't already at the school in many of the schools, spe specifically in inner city communities. 
Yeah, so it sounds like it, like, you know, it's, and it's part of the reality of many school districts, the lack of resources are like, you know, it's, and it's not until someone comes in and do the kind of work that you're doing that you realize all these other uh, resources that are lacking that you would give for granted before. Absolutely. So, yeah. So Maria Salazar, um, how many children um, you and I with parents after they arrive to the U.S.? Who financially is responsible for them? I'm not sure how much you, uh, you can um, respond to Maria Salazar, who's actually like one of our really active teachers here in the LAUSD community. Yeah, I think that's a hard question because we don't know, because it is a population that is quote unquote under the shadows and doesn't have status. Often we don't know exactly how many are arriving and we don't know many of their stories. Um, I think it depends on what, how the person comes and who they come with and where they make it. Oftentimes, um, there is a process of reunification, but that isn't really happening at the time and not with every child. Um, I think the financially responsible piece is interesting um, because wherever they actually land, if they are with extended family members, it's often um, with them. Often family members are sending money for the child. Um, we recently saw on the news these stories of migrant children who are employed in many corporations and um, warehouses and factories across the United States violating child labor laws. And so often kids have to be responsible for themselves and work, you know, jobs while trying to go to school and also trying to send money back to their families in the country of origin. So it is a complicated, nuanced um, situation that I think children and families navigate in, in different ways. Um, so it, I hope that that answered part of the question, but the short is that we, we don't necessarily know for sure. Well, thank you for addressing that. That was a complicated, but necessarily the question that many of the teachers have. So thank you for, for providing a really uh, thorough response. Um, and now from uh, Dr. Ruben Hernandez Leon, is, do you know of a similar work being done by scholars and activists in Mexico and Central America with people who have returned? Um, there are some pieces that I've seen um, I saw something about like dreamers del otro lado, um, like people who got deported and um, live in Mexico. And um, there's a campaign of moms of dreamers del otro lado. So parents that get deported and are also organizing on the other side of the border. Um, there's a project out of UC Davis that has a mural project of undocumented veterans that got deported, which is also, you know, a whole nother layer um, of, of nuanced um, military situations of folks who often have um, gone to wars and, and get deported after um, that time. And so these stories are painted on the border wall. There's these digital humanity projects that are really powerful and beautiful. And I think um, there's an exhibit or a documentary along with that project. But in terms of drawings and children, I would love, love, love to know if you all know of people in Mexico or Central America that are working on this project or something similar, not necessarily maybe using drawings, but art in general. I think that would be um, something I would like to know if you all um, have any information about it. Yes, definitely. So Phil, anyone in the and, and who's listening, who, who's currently joined, please feel free to continue sending your questions, comments via the chat. Um, something that I that I was really curious that you mentioned that other topics came up during your research, other than immigration, like you mentioned something about climate change and other topics. If you would want to check, like in the, we have a few minutes left, if you want to like share some of those topics that came up from this study? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I would do is that I would ask kids to watch the news. And then when we would meet, I would ask them, what was the most important news story that you, that you saw? 
Um, and often they would talk about, most of the time they were talking about the border wall because this was during the time of the election and the rhetoric in the media was who's gonna pay for the wall and all of that. And so kids would come and talk about that. But oftentimes they also would wanna talk about like North Korea and Syria and these very like foreign affair um, matters. And that was really surprising because they wanted to talk about what the country was going through, what the world was experiencing. Um, they also talked about fun things like drawing, like going to parties, about their favorite foods. So honestly, it would be about so many things, but because there are they are first and second generation immigrant children, um, they often would lead back to immigration and specifically to Trump, who was always on the on the news. Um, and so we would talk about him. And there are many drawings that portray him. But it's interesting because the kids in Arizona also mostly mention Sheriff Joe Arpaio, which to me is has a direct relationship with this figure of Trump and Sheriff Joe Arpaio. And in fact, Sheriff Joe Arpaio was the first person that Trump pardoned during that pardoning period. Um, and so these two figures were really prominent more than any other person in their lives and, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, really telling. Yeah, definitely. Well, what, what are we willing data <laughs> by far? <laughs> oh, thank you so much for, for sharing this. And we do have an, a here question comments by Dr. Uh, Marjorie Orellana from here from UCLA. Um, thank you for your thoughtful and work making children's perceptions and ex experiences of uh, migrant threats of deportation more visible to the world. Uh, could you offer suggestions for, of, for how teachers should respond to children's words or are ways that won't further traumatize? Or what might you suggest that how to create safe spaces in classrooms for these conversations? Could you say more about the theater activities you used? Yeah, there's a really wonderful book called Games for Actors and Non-Actors, and it's written by Augusto Boal. And I found that it, it is very hard to not see images about family separation or, or deaths um, or pain and walk away, you know, feeling 100% fine. Um, but I would lean into the moment to talk about what children wanted to talk about, who wanted to add something, who felt what. Um, before class, I would also do meditation activities with the kids because I felt that that centered them and brought them all into the same space. Um, but there's a lot of data on um, meditation and, and different activities that are meditative, like drawing and uh, like other art forms that provide that um, the nervous system uh, to be balanced. And so I would make sure to integrate some of those activities. Um, the icebreakers and the games of actors and non-actors really has hundreds, hundreds of, of activities that people can do with different people, specifically with children and young people. And so I would really lean on that and pull out activities uh, and make sure to close class in a way that wouldn't leave anything just hanging and that they had to just go and deal with. So oftentimes we would go over time. We would, I would stay after with um, kids to talk about some of the things that would come up. But I would say that the biggest tool was probably the journals that they kept because there I felt that they could process some of that more deeply. Um, but I think this is a really important question and, and so necessary to keep at the forefront. Well, yes. Thank you so much for, for such a prompt response. Um, from Alison Caesar, did I hear that you say something about images painted on the border wall? Where do I find where do I find more information from a middle school museum studies class? Thank you. Yeah, um, I would look at UC Davis humanizing, I can't remember what it's called, I'm going to look it up right now, but um, it is a project that is coming out of a few departments there, and they work with folks on the border and have um, done these 
the murals that I was describing, but I'll, I'll look for the name and share it in the chat. Yeah, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Silvia Rodriguez-Vega for, for, for this uh, resource. And I know we're getting closer to our, our time. Um, and I just wanna ask you if there's anything that you would like to share with us that you haven't um, shared yet uh, regarding your this new book that you just published. Um, any data or any anecdote that you would like to um, let us know about? Or any, especially, especially more focused to our teachers that we have here in the audience, which is the majority of our audience, K through 12 teachers here in Los Angeles area, that their population, their students that they work with um, are immigrant-based students? Yeah. So before answering that question, I want to say for Allison, um, if you look up Dr. Lisbeth, um, de la Cruz Santana. She is one of the, I think, um, research assistants that it was part of that project and has published some information about the border murals that I was talking about. But in terms of what I would say specifically for teachers, I think I found very powerful to combine ethnic studies Chicano studies, Mexican-American studies into some of the more formal education pieces, I found that it was very powerful to introduce kids to El Teatro Campesino and to the long lineage of using art to talk about social issues and things that were happening. Um, and so I felt that that provided an opportunity to think critically and to see how maybe they had things that they wanted to discuss and, and talk about. Um, and so I would say that there is something there with that com uh, combining those two, which is really powerful, but also to look into the mindfulness practices. I think that that is where I personally would like to see education lean towards, um, because I think that especially after uh, the last couple of years that we've had, it is so essential to think about the wellness of our students, not just their mental wellness, but overall um, wellness um, as human beings. 